Okay, um, welcome to this week's online course Infra Seminar. Um, so today we have Johannes Texter from Radebaugh University, um, and he will give us a tutorial on the R package uh, DAGGT, if I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I did not. So we are doing a, a experiment this week. Um, this is the first time we're doing a tutorial on R packages. Uh, so we do hope uh, this will be a more interactive session. Um, so I'm gonna switch to uh, Emma, will, who will handle all the Q and A. Thank you. Um, so welcome again to the Kabbalah Infra Seminar. If you have a question, please submit it on the Q and A. You um, that way we can answer the question live. Uh, the Johannes will plan to stop a few times during his talk to answer questions, and I may ask you to ask your question live in person. So we definitely encourage asking questions during this session. Uh, also, just keep in mind that the session is being recorded. So if you ask your question live in person, just know that your uh, recording of your voice may be posted online later on. Okay, uh, well, I hope you all enjoyed the talk, and I'll give it over to Johannes. Yeah, thanks uh, Emma and the others for uh, this kind invitation and for organizing this seminar. I will try to start sharing my screen. Um, which doesn't work. <clears throat> um, okay. Let's see, I have a small problem here apparently. Yeah, now it's working. Okay, <clears throat> so I hope that you can see my slides now. Can you see my slides? Okay, great. Okay, thanks for um, joining this uh, afternoon for me and it's I think the morning for a lot of you. So um, good morning to most of you. And uh, I want to talk about, um, actually um, I was invited to talk about the R package Decati, but I also want to talk about a few other packages. Um, so <clears throat> yeah. Uh, because I think a lot of um, nice other things also have been developed. So I will show not only things from the DECTR packages, but also from other packages. And um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge a lot of people who have been involved in uh, developing this package and <clears throat> the underlying theory um, behind this package over the years, some of whom are present here. So for example, <clears throat> Emma, who uh, is one of the panelists and uh, worked with me and others on developing adjustment set theory in her PhD. And then people in my group, Anku, Ankan and Inge Wortel worked with me on <clears throat> developing testing methodology. People at the University of Lübeck and Leeds um, um, and uh, at Potsdam also contributed to yeah, a lot of these uh, things I will be showing either directly or indirectly through discussions. And I also want to acknowledge some funding. So thanks to all of these people and thank you for joining again. And so before I start, yeah, I want to provide an overview of the things I want to be talking about today. So um, <clears throat> this is mainly um, structured into three different parts. In the first part, I would like to explain a few basics about the Decati R package. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, and in the second part, I want to show how you can combine Degati with other R packages that have been, uh, that are out there and that kind of provide complementary functionality. And this is something I've actually, um, yeah, been trying to invest a bit more time in, into making, because I think we have a lot of nice packages out there developed by different people. And sometimes for the user, it would be nice, it would be, if it would be a bit more easy to kind of fuse all of these packages together. And um, <clears throat> this is something I hope that, uh, I can at least uh, get started uh, with some of the things that I've been doing in the past few days. Um, and if I get to it, um, I hope I will, then I will be talking a bit more in depth about a topic that I think is quite important, uh, namely the topic about testing uh, DAG models. Okay, and uh, the intention is to actually take a quick <clears throat> break after each of these parts and also allow um, questions to be asked. And I would really appreciate questions. You will also, yeah, you can see code on my slides. If you want to, you can try out the code <clears throat> while I'm talking and maybe you have some follow-up questions or some suggestions. 
maybe also some um, yeah, ideas about other things that should be implemented in this package or in other packages. So I would be really interested in hearing those things. So let's uh, get started. Um, so Degity itself is actually not an R package, but it's a web application um, that I developed back in 2010. So I think it's one of the oldest um, causal inference programs out there. It's still being used quite a lot, as you can see on this graph here that I haven't actually updated in a few years. But you can see a few major spikes here. So one uh, major event apparently in 2017 and another event in 2018. So I think at least one of these two has to do with publication of the book of why, which um, <clears throat> yeah, increased interest in the field of causal inference quite a lot. I don't think that explains the first spike here. I'm not quite sure what explains that. So if you have any idea, let me know. But at present, I think it's about 1,000 people per day that are accessing this website. And I believe that most of these people are students who are taking courses, um, because I know that this program is being used in a lot of causal inference classes out there. Um, so this thing is a web application, and that means it's been developed in JavaScript. And underneath this thing is a pretty massive JavaScript library that um, that implements all of these methods that are available in this web application. <clears throat> and so the initial idea of the DECT R package was basically to just take that library and make it available from inside R. So initially, the first version was really just a very thin wrapper around this JavaScript library. But now <clears throat> there have been a few more functions added uh, that are actually proper R code. Um, and so the first person I also want to credit here is Jeroen Ohms, who wrote a package called V8, so another R package, which is basically a JavaScript interpreter that's running inside of R. And that's what makes it possible for this Dagity package to work. <clears throat> I mean, without this V8 package, you would have to have developed the entire um, code, like the entire code base of Dagity again. And that's something I considered back at the time, but I actually decided against that. I mean, for several reasons. One reason being that it would take a lot of time. And the second reason being that because Dagity has quite many users, um, it has also matured quite sufficiently over the years. So the code base is fairly mature. There have been a lot of bugs discovered by various people that I fixed. And each of these bugs went into one of these unit tests. Um, so, and that's kind of a typical feature of a very well developed code base is that you, you acquire these unit tests and really a lot of testing um, over the years. And that's something I didn't really want to redevelop from scratch. Um, because typically in research, we don't have the kind of resources that you actually need in order to develop really high quality code bases that have high testing coverage and so forth. This for me was kind of a shortcut. Um, so it, it may not be ideal, of course, right? So whenever you run something in the Dagity R package underneath, there's a JavaScript engine running that code. And it's maybe not the nicest thing from a technical perspective. Um, but for me, it, it, yeah, these kind of advantages that I could just reuse that code and that I knew that this code was actually mature, for me, that, that kind of um, <clears throat> that had a heavier weight. But if anyone out there wants to redevelop really everything in pure R, then um, yeah, I would really like to know. Um, because yeah, maybe it was a nice idea, but it's also a substantial undertaking. So, um, and before I go into the package, I want to also explain what I believe who this package is for. And that actually is not only for the package, the R package, but also for the website. So um, <clears throat> I'm now mostly an applied scientist, I would say. So I work in a hospital and in a medical hospital with my research group. Um, a lot of my projects are within the domain of cancer research. And um, so from my perspective, from where I am, <clears throat> I can see DAX being used in different ways. So one use is certainly theoretical. So a lot of you here are using DAX as a tool for development, or maybe I, would, I shouldn't say tool, but like a formal framework for development of causal inference methodology. Um, and then there's practical uses. And I like to kind of subdivide that into positively and negatively practical use. Um, maybe not the nicest words, but what I mean by that is that you can either use a DAG to basically show that somebody else's study is wrong, because you could say, you know, you haven't taken this bias into account, or that's actually that problem, and you didn't account for that. Um, <clears throat> and that's, I think, been quite successful in a way, and <clears throat> DAGs have been yeah, used to show quite a few problems that affect people's studies. But the actual idea would be 
also some positive idea that you actually use DAX in, in, as models of some data then generating process in some domain and that you actually use DAX for causal influence, you know, so that's what ultimately also all the people who are working on theoretical development kind of want at the end of the day, you want your methodology to be used in a, in a constructive positive sense. But that requires that you actually build a DAG for one specific problem. <clears throat> and I don't know if you noticed, but at, at, at present, I would even say that the amount of good theoretical papers in this field is higher than the amount of good empirical papers that actually use DAGs to do something. And I think one of the problems is that <clears throat> it's still quite hard to build accurate DAGs. Um, and yeah, and that's for several reasons. Um, but one thing that is also lacking or has been lacking is software. So one of the things I wanted to achieve here with this uh, package is I wanted to help the people who are brave enough to try to put this methodology into practice. And there's still not enough of them. Uh, so we are still not there, but this is basically who the package is mostly for. So it's not for the people who want to use latest, greatest uh, results of the causal inference theoretical field, but more for the people in the wild who are probably trying to build DAGs and trying to apply them. So I think that's important to realize. Okay, so and that's out of the way. I would like to start with introducing a few of the features. So the first, and I think the Thinking back, I think maybe most important feature of Daggerty is maybe the um, language because it has an embedded string based language that you can use to define causal diagrams. And this is actually not so the first language that Daggerty used was not this, but it was a different language that was basically taken from a different program that existed at the time. Um, but I quite early on realized that there were some problems because in the causal inference field we have yeah, specific uh, specific uh, requirements for, for for graphical models that are not usually addressed in standard graphical yeah, or graph libraries for example we have different types of graphical models we have not only dax but for example we have other things like cp dax pax max you know a lot of more other models are being developed all the time what we also have is we have different types of edges, right? So we have in our models, we have directed edges, but you can also have bi-directed edges, partly directed edges, edges with different types of circle marks and so forth. And um, if you look at, for example, you could implement um, a, a graph using adjacency matrices, um, but that kind of quickly becomes a bit tedious. And what I really wanted was a syntax that was expressive and allowed me to define DAX kind of in a, in a compact, concise manner. And that would also be extensible and would also kind of fulfill the specific needs of the causal inference field. Um, so what I, um, I did some research on existing languages and what I liked best was this uh, syntax of the program graph this, which I don't know if you know that, but it's, um, it's basically a program that has been around for a, lot, a long time uh, that is used to lay out uh, graphs. So I basically just took that language because it has almost all the features that, that I wanted. And I just um, made some small extensions. And for the most part, uh, this, this, for example, would be compatible with Graphis, right? So unless you are using some of the more fancy edge types or maybe graph types that Graphis doesn't understand, you kind of remain compatible. So this language is, um, has different levels of complexity. The easiest thing that you can do is just say, you know, I want a DAG. So you start by specifying the type of model that you want. In many cases, that's the DAG. Then you have curly braces where you actually put your um, actual model into. You can also give your DAG a name if you want. So you could say DAG XYZ. So then your DAG has a name, but a lot of people don't use that. Um, and now, for instance, the easiest thing would be just to write a list of edges. So A to E, E to D, and so forth. And that would generate this structure. Um, okay, so that, that's easy. Um, <clears throat> and then there are a few useful features that you could use in order to make your syntax more compact. For example, you can use this quite useful grouping operator, which um, takes a set of a, a DAG or a graph and basically specifies it as a substructure. So here, for instance, you're using that to say that the node Z has edges that go to A, E, and D. So you're specifying three edges in one. And here you're specifying two edges in one and so forth. The syntax doesn't really require these semicolons because it understands that a new uh, statement is starting here, but you can just put them for visual clue if you want to, if that makes the syntax easier to read, but these semicolons are kind of optional. 
So these nest, these um, subgraphs, they can also be nested. So you can have, for example, a subgraph in another subgraph, and that makes it easy, for instance, to define a complete um, graph that has complete um, uh, no missing edges, which can always be defined in this way fairly compactly. So by using this uh, grouping, you can <clears throat> have quite nice um, visually textually compact um, representations of the causal diagrams. And I think that's maybe the most useful functionality of the entire package, because this is an actual language and it has a parser. It's based on an actual formal grammar and so forth. So um, that, that took quite a long time to develop also. But I think still this is, yeah, <clears throat> this is maybe the thing I like best myself about this package is this language. Um, yeah, and then <clears throat> why actually is um, this tedious um, definition of the graph type necessary? Well, because for instance, um, these different graph types that can have quite different semantic implications. For example, talking about adjustment sets, which we will do later on. Um, if you take this thing and you interpret it as a DAG, then it's just a confounding triangle. So you can resolve this confounding by conditioning or by adjusting for Z. But if you read the same graph as a MAG, a maximum ancestor graph, then it has no adjustment set. So even the same graphical structure can have different semantic implications. So it's kind of important to know which type of graph you're dealing with. And uh, what I see in some other R packages is that they basically implicitly support only one type of graph, which is fine as long as you only support also this one type of graph in all your methodology, but it will make it e harder at some point to generalize your methodology to other types of graphs if you want to do that. Um, to, so at present, uh, Degati supports four different types of graphs, uh, DAX, PDAX, which can be complete or not, so which are basically uh, contain undirected and directed edges, MAGs and PAGs, um, but not all functions support all of these types. And as of today, basically I was making a few changes to the package before this talk. Uh, and I decided that um, by default, you should basically be able to omit this DAG thing if you don't need it because most people are using DAG. So then having always this daggity DAG thing is maybe a bit awkward. So from today on, you can, um, you can omit that and then it will put this DAG by default. If there are any questions, I just see something popping up and it's, um, it's about this, then you can also always ask and don't mind being interrupted if, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, I think then I'll, I'll read it out so that, uh, so that we have that recorded. So the question is from Anne Helby Peterson, have you considered a formula based rather than text-based syntax for graph specification? I would yeah. guess it would make it easier to get more native R graph objects that can be bonified, updated, interacted with, but maybe there is a good reason for not doing it like that. See, yeah, for example, course. Lava package for formula-based graphical model specification. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's an excellent, um, excellent question. Um, there are packages, for example, ggdeck that I will be showing later that actually implement this as well. They also say, okay, a formula-based interface would be more native uh, for R. That's actually true. So um, a lot of um, R packages are using formula instead of uh, strings. And I did think about this um, and my reason not to do that was that at the end, <clears throat> I decided that this formula based interfaces is, is quite useful if you have hierarchical models. For example, a deck that has only directed edges can be quite nicely represented as a formula because then you have on the left hand side, you have a node and then you're on the right hand side, you have the parents of that node, for example. So as long as you have only the X, <clears throat> that's, that's fine. But then um, as if you then start um, admitting other types of edges, it becomes a bit less nice because it doesn't map naturally onto this hierarchical idea anymore. Right? So for example, if you have also bidirected edges or maybe even undirected and bidirected edges, then you ha end up having to recreate this same thing again because then the model isn't hierarchical anymore. And um, so um, that's why ultimately I thought, okay, so what you get, for example, there's a package Lavan that is for structural equation modeling and it uses a formula-based interface, um, but it then also has to have special other syntax for accommodating bidirected edges, um, which I think is already not that, nice anymore, but maybe still okay if you have just one other type of edge, but in some graphs we have like six different types of edges. And then I thought this formula based interface might, like the advantages of that might not be that big anymore. 
Um, but there is a package, for example, ggdeck that has actually implemented a formula-based interface. As long as you only work, and ggdeck, for example, only supports DAGs. So as long as you're only working with DAGs and no bidirected edges, then you might, for example, use uh, ggdeck um, because it has this formula-based interface. Right, it's a very, it's indeed something that I considered um, back in the day. And maybe uh, something formula-based can also be added to this, um, <clears throat> but I think it would only work for a subset of the graphs that we are interested in. Okay, Great. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I think it's really useful if you, uh, you know, people could ask questions. Um, okay, so <clears throat> then the second thing that you need if you wanna actually plot the graph is that you need to have some kind of layout. So you need to know where the coordinates are and for that, there are graph layout algorithms, um, which um, can be used here, but you can also specify the coordinates either manually or maybe you build your DAG actually in Daggerty and then you just copy paste it into R. Or you can even store it on a web server and download, um, <coughs> download the graph. So um, if you have a simple graph, it's easy, of course, to just specify it in a text. But if you have a complex model with like some tens of nodes, then I think using a graphical interface becomes um, beneficial at that point. So this could be combined with, um, with, uh, with this uh, approach. <clears throat> okay. um, yeah, and then there are a few other functions for yeah, basic things, you know, things like parents, ancestors, children, descendants, so a lot of other packages, um, similar packages like VNLearn also have similar functions that allow you to query the structure of a, of a DAG and maybe also do some programmatic things. For example, if you wanted to implement a new algorithm, you could use this uh, method, these uh, functions to, to iterate over the graph or to traverse the graph in different directions and so forth. But it's also useful for users to maybe, um, yeah, to understand these concepts. For example, in graphical models, we tend to call um, a node an ancestor of itself, which isn't always super easy to explain to students. And so it's also useful to have these things implemented so just so that they can check um, this terminology. Um, <clears throat> children and parents, I think, are a bit more natural. Uh, something else that I've added is um, a rough, and I must say it's quite rough, um, <clears throat> ability to simulate data. So you can take a graphical model and you can then generate some data based on that model. Of course, here it becomes important what kind of parameterization you consider. So I've implemented two different things. One is a structural equation model where you can have, um, yeah, <clears throat> where you can have path coefficients and then you can just simulate data based on a Gaussian linear. Uh, model where each variable is a linear combination of its parents and some noise. And there's also, I don't know why the data isn't showing up here now, but <clears throat> there's also um, a model simulated log a logistic simulation model that basically generates um, binary data. So instead of um, generating continuous data here, you can generate discrete binary data. And that's also sometimes useful, for instance, if you want to, it's yeah, mainly useful for teaching, I think, if you want to make data sets with a certain property and then let students analyze the data set and see, for example, what the effect would be of um, conditioning on something. So, for example, it's then quite easy to, to implement this Simpson machine where you can condition on different numbers of variables and then your effect estimate kind of bounces back and forth at every step. Um, um, I don't know if there are more questions here. I think I see some things popping up. Yeah, there, there, the, there's two questions. Uh, I think one is a bit more technical. It's about, could you share Deity R routes? Uh, somebody had an issue installing it in R, but uh, not sure. And there's, a, there's another question from Fred on, can you simulate interventions on specific nodes? interventions on specific nodes. Um, <clears throat> no, that's not yet implemented. Um, you could, of course, uh, change the graphical structure. And then, you know, for example, for do for do intervention, you could just uh, delete the edges that are going into a certain node and then simulate from the resulting graph. Um, but it would be, I think, a nice and actually easy addition to this. Actually, I've been asked the same question before by somebody else. So maybe I will just implement that. Um, now or maybe in the coming days, because I think it should be easy to just add one more parameter here and to say I want to intervene on something and keep it fixed. <clears throat> yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so then, um, yeah, one thing also in teaching um, that is quite uh, difficult sometimes for students to understand is the separation. So these kind of questions are coming from exercise materials from my courses. So let's say we have one path and then, <clears throat> yeah, do you just want to know is A D separated from F? I mean, most of you see this immediately, but for students, it's, yeah, not, yeah, it's one of the things that takes them a bit of time to get used to. So um, <clears throat> these kind of things can be um, done using the paths function where you basically take a deck and then you can list all of the paths that are going from one node to another node. Of course, this should be used with caution because in big decks, there can be so, yeah, millions or billions of paths, even if you have only 15 variables or so, because the number of paths grows uh, very quickly. But still, I think it's a very um, <clears throat> useful function for yeah, for teaching and for small models where you just see the flow of information and then you can also see how it changes when you condition on something. So for example, here you would see that the path is closed, but it gets opened once you condition on this collider T in the middle. And then also <clears throat> one of my very favorite things to explain is that when you condition on the con descendant of the collider, it also opens. And these kind of things, again, can be done by students by themselves so that they can check their own understanding of the, of the material. <clears throat> so this is not something I would recommend using in any algorithms. Like if you wanted to make a new algorithm, you probably shouldn't use path traversals ever because it's not going to scale very well. But it's still something that's quite useful for, for teaching and to uh, clarify important concepts of causal inference. Okay, questions here at this point? Yes, there's another question from Fred. Okay. Is it possible to import an existing graph from say edge list or adjacency matrix? Yeah, there are a few functions um, that are made indeed that make it possible to import graphs from different <clears throat> other formats. Um, I haven't documented them yet very thoroughly, um, but <clears throat> So actually, if you want any specific format, um, that's for everyone in this audience. If you want to import anything, anything specific into Daggerty, then please just write me an email or make a <clears throat> make you know an issue on GitHub, because these things can be very easy to implement and can make things quite easy for a lot of people. <clears throat> so I did some back and forth conversion for packages like B and Learn and so forth that I will show you later. But <clears throat> and for instance, you can also export edges into Python. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it could be quite easy to implement other import formats when necessary. Okay. Great. Great. There's uh, okay. Yeah. There's okay. actually another question. Yes. Uh, for the binary logistic simulation, is the stated correlation in the latent, uh, e.g., tetrachoric or expressed values? I think this was regarding the previous example. This was regarding the um, the stated correlation. Okay, so this, um, yeah, it's not very formally defined here, of course. So basically what you have is um, every node, um, every node is a binomial random variable <clears throat> and uh, um, um, the chance of this variable to be one is um, <clears throat> logistic um, transformation of the linear combination of the parents. So it's basically, a, it's just a generalized linear model. Um, <clears throat> and so for example, if you have a coefficient of 0.5, that would mean that the log odds ratio of this variable b here, for instance, to be one would be 0.5, uh, the log odds, I should say, not the log odds ratio. And that's <clears throat> that's how it's done internally. I hope that this answers your question. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, good, so where was I? Um, okay, so that was path inspection. <clears throat> Something else I've focused on quite substantially is covariate adjustment because it was also the first thing that the Daggerty web application could do. Um, so <clears throat> Daggerty implements quite um, fast algorithms and quite advanced ones for finding different types of adjustment sets. Um, if you use the adjustment set just with no um, <clears throat> other um, argument then it will just find an adjustment set, the minimal adjustment sets and will typically enumerate them all, but just the minimal ones because otherwise you would have too many. But if you really want to see all adjustment sets, you can uh, give this argument here and then it's actually going to iterate over all adjustment sets, which might be a lot. So you should again use this um, carefully, but it's possible if you need to. 
Um, yeah, and then, of course, this is also something that you require a lot in teaching causal inference methodology because covariate adjustment is one of the fundamental things that is being taught, I think, in most introductory courses. So this is also useful to <clears throat> explain to students, for instance, what the difference is between adjusting for a confounder and adjusting for a collider and that you can have things like n bias for even a variable that is <clears throat> maybe preceding the exposure and the outcome can still sometimes cause bias when you adjust on it. So yeah, and that's, <clears throat> that's um, I think one of the major focuses of this package. In practice, people have been trying to do this um, and sometimes with impressively <laughs> complex diagrams, I have to say. So this also has been built in the Daggerty web application and it's one of the many DAGs that we reviewed together with colleagues last year. We kind of went through a few, I think more than 200 papers and looked into all of the DAGs that we could find. Some of them are fairly complex um, like this one. And you can also see that they yeah, they provide a literature reference here for every edge that they put. So basically for every edge, they, they have a paper that says, there's, for example, that there's an impact of gender on psychosocial stress. And they also have a paper that says that there's an impact of psychosocial stress and hypertension. Um, <clears throat> I think it's quite commendable, but also um, maybe what they didn't understand here is that the actual assumptions of the deck aren't so much in the arrows that are present, but more in the ones that are not present. And uh, so those are, so you can see quite a few that are maybe missing. For instance, there's no correlation here between gender and smoking, uh, or at least no direct effect. So <clears throat> yeah, that's also one of the things I always do with students, like show them this and then ask them if they can see some arrows that might be missing here. But of course, it raises the question, how robust can these things then be in practice, right? If you have such a big DAG, um, how likely is it that this DAG is actually going to be correct if it's just built based on literature out of which maybe a lot of the papers that they cite here maybe are also not, um, not correct or maybe only partly. Um, so one thing that I wanted to plug here, which is also a very important paper that you should all know by Emma, um, is that you can always sometimes, you, you don't need to know the entire DAG if you want to do this. So for example, if you want to, um, compute an adjustment set, it could be enough to have only a CP DAG and not, not the complete DAG available. And that's not always possible, but in some cases it is. So for example, here in this um, example, um, that would be the DAG that they drew. And if you look at the CP DAGs, it looks like this. So the bold edges are become undirected um, because there are um, different orientations in the Markov equivalence class. And then you could also just use the same command to just get an adjustment set that is valid for the entire um, equivalence class. And here, surprisingly, there even is one, um, which might be, yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's a bit reassuring because at least it doesn't mean that the deck has to look exactly like this. Some, some uh, structural errors might still be okay. Okay, so now uh, this is an actual email that I got and I just wanted to circle back to this initial part where I said, you know, who are the people that these packages is developed for? I think it's people like this person here who is really trying to learn about causal inference and about DAGs and just has some questions. And um, I just went through this list and I think all of these questions at least could be answered by using the functions in this package. For instance, one question would be, okay, which variable would control for confounding? That's again, just you want to know adjustment sets. For example, you want to, you would see here that family income itself would be a sufficient adjustment set in this case. Is there anything that you can condition on or not? And it doesn't have so much of an impact. <laughs> well, yeah, once you condition on family income, then you can or cannot take maternal genes into your adjustment set. It doesn't impact the bias, but it might impact the precision of your estimate. And that's again, of course, a different topic. Um, and yeah, and this is the thing that is known as M bias. There are um, also variables that you could condition on or adjust for, and they would cause additional bias, which you can see, for instance, using the paths command, because you open a new path by conditioning on maternal diabetes, which becomes open here because maternal diabetes is a collider here. So that might increase or decrease, depending on the circumstances, uh, the bias of this estimate. Okay, so this was just a quick tour of the package in general. So that, yeah, I mean, um, 
of course, you can also read the documentation and look at the other functions. But uh, generally, what the package is supposed to do is, well, the maybe most important thing is that it offers the syntax for defining different types of graphical models, which I personally like. Um, and I think still it's quite useful and flexible. It also has fast algorithms implemented for finding, for example, deseparating sets, adjustment sets, and also instrumental variables and conditional instrumental variables. It has functions for testing models, which I think is quite an important thing, and it can simulate some data. But there's other things that it doesn't do. For example, it doesn't have very nice visualization capabilities. Um, it doesn't do structure learning. Um, and it also doesn't do non-parametric identification. And it's also partly intentional because <clears throat> um, there are other amazing packages out there that do these things. For example, PCALC, which does a lot of structure learning um, and also um, causal effect that implements nice identification algorithms. So now the next question becomes, how can we use DAGT together with these other packages and maybe exchange information back and forth? And that is a bit, yeah, the, the problem that we have maybe as a community is that there are nice different packages, but everyone that writes a new package comes up with a new syntax. So, so, so far there's no, there's, there have not been two packages that are using the same syntax. And that's a bit unfortunate because it means it becomes maximally difficult for the user to use these packages together. Um, so what I was trying to do is um, uh, write conversion functions that convert the DECT syntax back and forward to other packages. And it would be great if maybe some other package writers could also join me in this so that we could, yeah, that we could at least make it possible for the user while still, of course, making transparent that these are different packages by different people and also giving them the credit that they deserve. Because yeah, one solution to this problem would also be you just take some other package function and you import it into your package and you just hide it in your package, which is maybe fine, but maybe in an academic context, I'm not so comfortable doing that because it means that people, for example, might not get the credit anymore because the user doesn't see anymore that you're actually using a different package. And for somebody who's maybe a PhD student or postdoc and has invested a lot of time into developing a package, it's something that I don't want because I want people to see that, you know, for example, you are using this person's package and not hide it away. And that's something I don't really want to do. So um, <clears throat> one nice example of a package um, that provides visualization capabilities is GDDAC. It's written by Malcolm Barrett. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it um, has a lot of advantages compared to Degity. So one thing is it's a tidyverse package. Um, so Degity is not a tidyverse package because I'm maybe too old. So when I started learning R, the tidyverse didn't exist yet. Um, but this thing has, follows all the rules of the tidyverse. And it's, it also means you can combine it with ggplot. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's quite easy to get DAX from DAGT into ggdag because basically ggdag is built on top of DAGT. It's basically a, an interface that, that converts, that internally calls functions from DAGT, but uses a different interface on top of that. Um, um, and yeah, so you can easily make a DAG in the DAGT web interface and then do some stuff in DAGT, maybe simulate some data, and then you can also import it into ggdag to make some nice plots like these ones. So this is something that you can check out if you, if you, you know, like some visualizations. These things are focused on DAGs, so I don't think it supports anything except DAGs, but it does that um, quite well, and I think, um, has some really nice functionality too. Yeah, that maybe is also quite useful for students who are learning things like collider bias or adjustment and those kind of things. Um, another package I like very much, <laughs> um, no offense to PCALC, so I'm sorry I didn't pick both PCALC and BNLearn here. So the PCALC package is also great, but uh, personally in teaching I'm using BNLearn because it is a bit simpler to use and um, and learn is a package that has a lot of structure learning algorithms. And um, if you have, for instance, um, done some structure learning using BN learn, using some data set, and you get a graph back, then you can just use the as daggety thing to just convert that graph into a daggety object. And for example, <clears throat> list equivalent models, which is something that you can't do in BN learn, but you could do it in daggety. So that is quite seamless. You can just take the output of BN learn and convert it to and uh, Degity. But again, the syntax of the learn is, is very different from Degity syntax. So it has to be has to be an import function written. And yeah, of course, PCI is another very um, 
awesome structure learning package, which also has a function that you can use to convert the PCL adjacency matrices to, um, to um, Degity syntax, right, Emma? I think you are even an author on that function. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I found Degity very useful and wanted to use it. So that function came about as a result of that. <clears throat> yeah, so that is, means that you can also use PCI to learn your DAG using, uh, for example, some um, PC algorithm or um, <clears throat> FCI or something like that. And then you can convert the results to Degity if you want to use that for, I don't know, testing your model further or maybe doing some. Uh, instrumental variable analysis or something like that and um, then you can convert it to ggdag if you want so that that means this path is open and then i think also very nice um uh, is uh, cause and effect and actually there's several packages by santutica here's not only this one but also do search and and others that implement very um yeah a lot of this more recent identif identification methodology so causal effect itself uh, implements do calculus and not only the basic do calculus but also using some very fancy uh, algorithms to reduce the complexity of the resulting functionals and again so it's something i could implement in Degity, but it's already there right so i also want to give the person credit um, <clears throat> that has developed a package so the nicest solution for me is to just i wrote this convert function which um, you can use to convert Degity to other things and it supports the causal effect package. So if you want to do um, do calculus on your um, on your DAG, then you can just um, do this, and you can convert this to causal effect, and you get, a, um, for example, you get a function <clears throat> that you that you can use to estimate your causal effect if it's possible, and if it's not, then you know it's not identifiable. And uh, yeah, Santu also has packages that implement things like transportability and fusion of observation and experimental data. So you should really check that out. And I think that this thing will actually work <clears throat> for all of his packages because he's using iGraph internally and he has this syntax. Um, <clears throat> and he also in this newest package has written something that can also read the Degity syntax, not all of it, but to a fairly large extent. Okay, um, those were my examples of combining Degity with other packages. And I was wondering if there's any um, questions or suggestions here, because it's also something I'm kind of struggling with. I mean, on the one end, I want to make it easy for the user. And on the other end, I don't want to, I really don't want to take other packages and just hide them and expose functionality because that could have bad consequences for other authors. So if there's any suggestions on how to deal with this problem, then I'm very interested to hearing them. So at the moment, there is a question, not a suggestion, okay. um, from Anne. You mentioned that you can work with FCI algorithm output in Dagity. Does this mean that the package provides tools for working with tags? Yes. Yeah. So for example, um, if you want to compute adjustment set for packs, then you can use the adjustment set function on packs. Um, that's one, one thing that it does. And you can also, um, for example, reach the separation constraints of, of PACs and so forth. So PACs are generally supported not in all functions. For example, I don't have an algorithm that um, finds an instrumental variable in a PAC because that's, I think, an open research question if that, if that exists or not, or maybe it has been solved, I don't know. But um, yeah, some, some of the functionality also supports uh, PACs. Great. And there's one short question also uh, from Aleja Rodriguez Sanchez. She asks, is there some syntax for the identification of causal mediation that you know of? Identification of causal mediation. <clears throat> um, so, um, yeah, I think so. The syntax um, that I was describing is a syntax for specifying the model and not, not so much the identification problem. So, I think. Um, I know that there are packages that are doing causal mediation analysis, but I think typically you would keep the specification of the identification problem separate from the specification of the graphical model itself. I don't know if there have been any efforts to standardize the specification of identification problems. I don't think so. I think basically you just provide parameters to some function. Um, for example, here you can provide parameters if you want to condition on other variables. Um, um, but so I think there's no 
So there's currently no way to do it. And I also don't know if it's something that should be done because it's maybe outside of the scope of defining your graphical model. Great, thanks, Johannes. <clears throat> maybe we continue with that now. Okay. Okay, so I want to get to my last question. I need to check the time very quickly. I'm sorry, because I don't have a watch here. Um, so, and that's uh, model testing. So um, I want to help people to um, understand if their DAGs are basically making sense. Because of course, if you're doing dorsal inference based on a DAG, then the predictions that we are making, things like adjustment sets or do calculus are dependent on the DAG to be correct. And in practice, it's quite difficult to make a DAG that's correct. So my, I would say, main uh, research focus now is, is on modeling. So we're not using DAGs as models, but we are using other kinds of models. But indeed, if you build a model, any kind of model, then it's typically a kind of iterative thing. So you build your model, and typically, you don't get it right the first time you build your model. In the first case, you're going to make mistakes. So you need to challenge your model with data and then you need to learn what you've done wrong and you need to come up with a better model. And then by going through these iterations, <clears throat> you hopefully come up with better and better models. Um, I think this same logic also applies to DAX because DAX are models, right? So we are, we are drawing a model of how the world works. But what we've seen also when we looked at literature is that typically people just generate a one-off DAG for one data set for one specific question and then they expect this DAG to be correct. And I think that's kind of, um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe even a bit unrealistic to expect that you can just draw something and it's gonna be correct immediately. So I think this aspect of testing your model is, is quite important and maybe even improving your model once you find your mistakes. But it's something that in practice people have, I, I never see them do that. I think people most of the time just draw a DAG and then use it, but <clears throat> at least now in the literature, we can't really find people doing model testing. And I don't really know why that is. So one thing at least I want to make sure is that people can do model testing if they want to. And um, yeah, of course, <clears throat> yeah, you can do as much testing as you want. In the end of the day, you can not prove that your model is correct, but at least I think it's important to challenge the assumptions that you are encoding and seeing if they make uh, some sense. So as you know, in DAX, <clears throat> there are different types of constraints that they imply on probability distributions. And I'm going to focus here on constraints that you can read off by deseparation because they are applicable to most types of models. Um, so I, I assume that you are all familiar with deseparation, to be honest. Um, so for example, if you have this DAG, it makes no claims whatsoever about the data. But if you have this DAG, it would make four different claims about the data that you could um, that you could test. Okay, and each claim depends on at least one missing arrow. So it, the more arrows that you're leaving out, the more assumptions you're making. So let's look at this example here. <clears throat> we are drawing this DAG, which is basically a double mediation model. So we are assuming that your causal effect is mediated fully by these variables M1 and M2. But in reality, we have failed to incorporate the measurement error of the variable M1. So actually the actual mediator is something unobserved and your variable M1 is just a proxy of that. So in that case, um, you get two, implication of your, two implications of your model that you're testing, but the true model implies only one of them. So you should be able to see that when you test your implications. So if you want to do this with students, for example, to look uh, through this logic, then you can start again by generating some data. So here I'm generating 10,000 samples. And um, then you could test, yeah, this is one thing that you can also do using the Daggerty package. So you can take an independence implication and just test it. And there are different types of tests implemented among which the chi-square test for uh, discrete data. And if we test these two things here, then we see here, for instance, that our, yeah, if you look at the p-value, we see it's fairly high. So we don't see any strong evidence against dependence from that. And if you look here, then the p-value is fairly low. I think we should not only look at the p-value, but also at the effect size. <clears throat> so here we are providing chi-square, for instance, as an effect size. With two degrees of freedom, a chi-square of one isn't that unexpected, but if you have four degrees of freedom, chi-square of 421 seems quite a lot. So <clears throat> there you see that there's probably something wrong with this implication here. 
Um, so in a decorative package, you can do this either using individual calls to um, the CI test function or using the local tests function, which basically just takes all of the deseparation implications implied by the model and tests them one by one. And it's going to give you a table of the results so that you can investigate the model. And there's also a plot function that plots your, um, <clears throat> your effect sizes along with confidence intervals so that you can see how far off you are. And I think it's also important to look at that and not only at p-values. So here we would see, for instance, that we have two things that are being implied, one of them being very much off and the other one being more or less okay. So if you would apply that to a more real situation, let's say we have this very widely known adult census income data set collected in 1994. So let's suppose somebody draws this causal diagram for some reason. Um, and they don't put an arrow from sex to income here. So for example, here they would be claiming <clears throat> that there is no gender pay gap, which is probably not correct. So that's something that we should be able to pick up using this methodology. And um, here we have provided a clean version of the data that contains only subset with 30,000 records. It's just a random subsample. And yeah, and now you see one of these problems. So if you apply your this testing methodology to that data set, then you will easily falsify all of your implications just because um, the data set is so large that even the smallest deviation from the zero and not the zero effect size will be picked up. I don't know if this may be one reason why people don't test their models in practice because in practice they will be, <clears throat> I mean, I've done this for many years with students and I've never seen any student produce a model that didn't fail quite brutally sometimes in, in the first uh, instance. So I think this is very, very, very common, very typical. But of course, here we have also a statistical problem because we're only looking at p-values and we have a quite large sample. So <clears throat> that means that we are going to pick up very small deviations from um, the conditional independence here. But I think it might be more useful to look at how strong these dependencies actually are. And that's where an effect size can be useful. So for chi-square tests, there are different types of effect sizes. We are using this one, which is the root mean square error of approximation. Normalized uh, version of the... I'm having a huge thunderstorm in my home. I don't know if you can hear it or if you can still hear me, but I can't unfortunately do anything about it. So um, <clears throat> if you have a true model, then this RMCA would be expected to be zero. But... Um, if your model is wrong, then it will convert to some constant positive value as n goes to infinity. So it means that it will be stable approximately with sample size. The higher the value, the worse the model fit. So if you do that here, then um, we find indeed that there's kind of a hierarchy. So all of these things are off, but there's big differences between how bad they are off. And um, what we find here interestingly in this data set is that by far the worst implication that is violated is that marital status and sex are not independent. And that's a peculiar one because this is a data set from 1994. So there was no, <clears throat> there was only um, heterosexual marriage then. So you should by definition have as many married men and women in this data set. Um, so what this basically means is that it's a very, very strongly skewed sample of the population. Um, and that also shows that by testing the model, we can learn not only something about the model, but we could also learn something about the data, because in this case, the data is, um, is off, right? It should be supposed to be a census sample, so it should be representative, but it's clearly not. So some somewhere in the middle, something must have gone wrong. Uh, my own idea is that someone added a lot of married men to this data set, because the ultimate goal here is to predict income. <clears throat> and if you want to enrich your data set for rich people, then you're probably going to have a lot of married men in there. So that's what I suspect happened here. But it's also something that nobody ever saw, even though this data set has been used in countless Kaggle challenging, Kaggle challenges and whatnot. So I think it's, it shows that it can be useful to test models. Um, you can also do the same thing for continuous data. <clears throat> um, then you're using Gaussian or um, linear conditional independence testing instead of chi-square, but the principle is generally the same. You just read off your deseparation implications and you can translate them, for example, into linear regression models. Um, or you can you look at the partial covariance. Um, <clears throat> and again, we have um, conditional independence tests implemented here for 
continuous data as well. So where here the estimate is just a partial correlation coefficient, which is also interpretable because it's on a scale from minus one to one. Okay, um, so I think this is, yeah, I would hope that more people would use this functionality or maybe not this, but some other model testing functionality, but for some reason <clears throat> it's not being done and I'm still not quite sure why. Okay, so um, given the time, I believe I will stop here um, because yeah, I actually talked about most of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, just let me quickly mention some um, future plans. So uh, what I want to do in the future with this package is uh, work more integration with other packages so that for users, it becomes easier to use all of the products of our community. Um, technically, I need to re-implement um, the library at some point in ES6, which is a new version of JavaScript. And I also want to mention that um, <clears throat> there is uh, a nice Python library out there. So for the people who prefer Python, um, PGMPy, which is a nice library for Bayesian networks. And the author of PGMPy is Anku Ankan, who's working in my group as a PhD student at the moment, and is extending PGMPy uh, also by some nice causal inference functionality. Um, so yeah, you should check that out if you like Python and also give us feedback. And if you have any more suggestions and some, I don't know, feature requests or something, then you can just let me know. And now I thank you for listening. Uh, as long as you could listen to me without a sun, thunderstorm. And <clears throat> yeah, if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer. Great. Thank you so much, Johannes, for such a nice talk. I do, we do still have a few more questions. Um, I'll let Christian Gishe ask his question live now. So, okay, I'm also Christian, going to start sharing here. Yeah. You can ask your question. Um, thank you, uh, Johannes, for this very helpful talk. Uh, my question is, um, uh, which package would you use to estimate um, causal effects once you have ensured that they're identified with one of the features you have uh, showed us? Is there a package that you would recommend yeah. for estimation? <clears throat> yeah, I think that depends a lot on how you, est how you identify your causal effects. So for example, if you're using instrumental variable identification algorithms and you're going to use, for example, two stages least squares to estimate your effect, and then you could use R packages like AER or something. <clears throat> um, adjustment, for example, it would also depend on how you're going to, how you're going to fit your uh, model at the end. If, if you're going to use a generalized linear model or a linear model or maybe even propensity score model. Um, so I guess the, the thing is that there's kind of, there's a bit of a disconnect sometimes between um, identification and estimation. And I think it's also something that is being addressed by a lot of work that is being done. But um, I think there's no one package I would recommend for for estimation. For instance, if you use do calculus, right? It's, it can give you a hugely complex formula, which in theory is a formula for your causal effect, but there might not be a there might not be a lot known about how this would work as an estimator, right? So that might be an open that might be an open question in some cases. Um, but if you are focusing on, for instance, instrumental variables and adjustment sets, then you have access again to quite advanced methodology that you could use for estimation. Great, uh, thank you. So I think in the interest of time, we should wrap up, but Johannes, we will pass and participants will pass on all the unanswered questions to Johannes and suggestions. So um, be sure that that will be delivered. All right. Thanks. All right. So uh, thanks, Johannes, again for your uh, wonderful tutorial. Uh, so for next week, uh, we will have uh, Anish Agarwal and Dennis Shen, um, who will talk about synthetic interventions. So I'll see everyone uh, next week.